All right, well, you can get on your feet if you like. Welcome to Church in the Park. We're Northview Community Church. If you're visiting with us, let's worship the Lord together. Spirit, spirit. 
love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. the ushers to come forward as we continue in our worship, uh, giving back to God our tithes and our offerings. Uh, it's just another way that we uh, worship the Lord. And if you're joining with us uh, this morning, we don't want anything from you. Uh, it's just our gift to have you here. Um, but yeah, for those that call Northview home, this is another way that we, we get to worship the Lord. So let's pray over our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we get to gather here this morning and declare that your love never fails. There's no height, no depth that could ever separate us. Nothing that we've ever done or no one that we've ever been that could separate us from your love and uh, your, your redeeming blood that was shed on the cross for our, us. And so Lord, as we come here this morning, we worship you with our tithes and our offerings. We're reminded of, we're reminded of two things, that um, we belong to you and uh, we own nothing. Lord, everything 
you own. Everything we think we own uh, belongs to you, and you have given it generously to us. So uh, we thank you for um, just the gift that we have to be able to steward uh, what's really yours. And uh, Lord, I pray that this morning as we give to you, Lord, you would receive our offerings as an expression of our love and our gratitude for all that you are and all that you've done. pray this in your name. Amen.
God, we are here this morning because we believe in who you are. May this morning be dedicated to you. We thank you for this church, Lord. We thank you for the members turning up this morning to celebrate, to worship, and to give honor and praise to you. May you be with us this morning. May you be with Steve as he shares his testimony. May it be just a testimony unto your love and who you are. We give you this morning, Lord. Be with us and just continue to bless this church in your son's name. Amen. You guys can go ahead, give some high fives around as you find your seat, as you find your blanket. Once again, welcome to Church in the Park. We're excited that you're here. Are you guys excited to be here? Awesome. So here's the deal. Yes, we're at church, but we're also at a park. Parks are fun, right? Can we have a fun for a couple minutes? Is that okay? Awesome. Well, my name is Rob. If I haven't met you yet, I'm the Student Ministries Director. Hello. My name is Kayla, and I am the Children's Director at Northview. And so we are going to play a very fun game. So. We need, or should we explain the rules first? Or should we get volunteers without them knowing what they're getting into? Perfect. All right, we need four volunteers. So please raise your hand if you are excited about raising hands. Oh, perfect. Okay, Mr. Dave, yeah. come our way up. Let's give these volunteers a hand. They're so brave. Perfect, perfect. One more. Oh, it's perfect. Micah, right in front of you. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Give him one more hand. Here we go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, volunteers, thank you so much. You guys are amazing. So this is the game that we are going to be playing. We, uh, we don't have really have a name for it. We'll call it um, Grab Some Stuff. So Grab Some Stuff. The way this game works is Rob and I are going to announce some items that these four people need to acquire from other people in the audience. So um, whoever is able to bring back the most items first wins uh, or gets to pick out of the prize bin first. So, should we tell them what our prizes are, Rob? I think, I think we'll, tell, we'll let you guys know what the prizes are. Kayla's going to grab them. So, first of all, whoops, that's cool. We have the one, the one that matters. So, we have a variety of things. Seahawks season has started, so we have a Seahawks jersey to give away. Sorry, Dave. And then we also have, pick up something else. We got a Chick-fil-A gift card, oh, always good. $40. We have a student ministry gift in there for a free student ministry sweatshirt. And then a tub of licorice. So the way it's going to work is one of these four are going to be able to pick which prize they want to take home with them. You guys are going to help them out. Maybe they'll share. Maybe they won't. Are you guys ready? Yes. Come on, let's right. Okay, Melissa. Okay. All right. We're going to start off easy, hopefully. The first item that you guys must get is a bobby pin. Bobby go! Pin. Bobby pin, quick! Bobby pin, girl! Bring me the bobby pin! Bobby pin! Bobby pin. Yeah. Bobby pin. Yeah. Someone get yeah. Bobby pin! Run, run, yeah. run! Yeah. Woo! Good job, James! All right, that's a point for James. Well done, well done. Good job, Melissa got second. Where's my team? <laughs> Come on! I uh, don't have a bobby pin, I'm sorry. Yeah, Riley, Riley, you're good. <laughs> Good job, there we go. Perfect. We got We're one. still searching, we got one, yes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good job, Emily. All right! Woo! <laughs> Perfect, okay. All right, next up, it's hot out, it's warm out. You guys need to go fetch. <laughs> Melissa, absolutely no cheating. <laughs> sunscreen. Go, you got sunscreen, hurry, 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 who's got sunscreen? Who came prepared to the park? Whoa! Redemption! Whoa, James in second is impressive. Good job, good job. Good job. Hustle Riley, good job, good job! Alright, that was amazing. 
Oh. Oh, there you go. Ooh, okay. This next item, you cannot use your own. Cough, cough. You have to get a pair of sunglasses. Go! Oh man, so many volunteers for that one. There we go. Whoa! So we are we are at church in the park, right? A necessity, an essential of church. First one back with a Bible. Oh, the Bible, Bible. Who brought the word? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice, Riley! <laughs> oh, that was amazing. Nice hustle. Oh, a phone. <laughs> that worked. Yeah, phone in your Bible. It's the same thing. Yeah. All right, this one will be unique uh, and maybe a little bit smelly. You have to come back with one Birkenstock. Go. For those of you wondering how you're gonna get your stuff back, not part of our game. <laughs> All right, it's hot, it's warm, we gotta stay hydrated. Find me a hydro flask. favorite one. This one's my favorite one. The first person. <laughs> the first person to come back with a lawn chair wins. Go! Wow, that was, that was right first. Oh, oh, oh! That had to be a tie. Oh, send it, send it! That was impressive. My goodness. You got this, Melissa! Woo! <laughs> So, we already got a shoe. It cannot be your own, but we need a sock. A left sock, left sock, left, make the L. You need to get whoever out here, no, no judgment from us, whoever out there you would consider to be a friend. Abby, come here. But hurry up. Who's got a friend? Oh, nice, Riley. Oh. <laughs> that is commitment right there. Oh my goodness, I love it. Nicely done. Yeah, I know. Ooh. All right, we have two people that are tied right now, so we need a tiebreaker. This one may be the most trusting, the most, um, I'm not winning. this will be interesting. If you can get an iPhone 10 up here, oh, you win. Oh, no, 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 all of you, go, go, an iPhone 10, who's willing? <laughs> Seahawks jersey, Chick-fil-A, free sweatshirt, or licorice. I have never been to Chick-fil-A. So oh, okay. Yeah. Second, Mr. Dave. We, we, can, we can get a larger size. Uh, Melissa. I will take the student because the kid can't help her die. There you go. James, you get a whole tub of licorice. You don't even have to share it. All right, the second, the second part of the game is you guys get to figure out who all that goes back to. So, good luck. And uh, if you would all give a round of applause for our contestants. 
And while you're doing that, keep that round of applause going for Pastor Steve as he comes up. Uh, yeah, you are. I know he's going That was fun. James, 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 James. We're buddies, right? Yeah, licorice. There we go. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? I don't think I'm working. Am I going? Can you hear me? We're all good out there? Louder? They can't quite hear me. There we go. How's that? There we go. Great to see everybody. How are you? Uh, if this is your first time with us, we just want to say welcome, and we hope it's a great time Hope you enjoy the day together. We're thrilled you've chosen to come and spend the morning with us. Northview, you're looking good. Isn't this fun? We actually get to see everybody. So what I want to encourage you today is take your time. Some of us are in first service, some second. So make sure you take your time and uh, get to say hi to people you don't normally get to cross paths with at church. And uh, we've got lots of time to hang out. We've got games over here. We're going to have volleyball up there. We've got kickball. We've got stuff going on. So you don't have to rush after today. It'll be great and, ta- and uh, get a chance to hang out with each other. Uh, I want to uh, highlight some special friends that are here. Last year, we got a chance to go to Slovenia and Ljubljana and visit David and Katka Bordner, and they're actually here today. David and Katka, where are you? There you are. Give them a hand. There's Katka. There's David over there. Yeah, they used to be married. Now they're not together anymore. No, they're fine. <laughs> They're doing good, and uh, Liam and Ayla and Taylor are here with them as well, so you can get to know their kids and visit with them, and they've gotten big since we've seen them, so it's a lot of fun. You know, uh, for to kick off today, if you think in our culture, there's a lot of opinions about church and uh, what it is and what it does. Uh, many circles, the question has arisen, is it even necessary? We can be nice people without going to church. Right, And we can help community without going to church. And uh, we can care about great causes without going to church. So uh, people go, is it even something we have to do anymore? But I think when you really think about it, those questions or statements miss the mark a little bit because they put all the emphasis on the people in the church uh, who, who attend the church. And they miss the central fact that the church is more about the person behind the church than it is about the people in the church. And of course, the person behind the church is Jesus. Oh yeah, that guy. The guy in the stories. Wow, people still buy into that stuff? Amazing. right? But the truth is, Jesus isn't just a story. Although his story is the most famous one in the world. And Jesus isn't just an idea. Although his ideas have changed history. The Bible says that he's the savior of the world. Now, these days, we don't connect with that idea very well. Savior isn't a term we kind of think or uh, spend time in most of the time, or or even why we need one. We seem to be doing pretty good. So, but an idea that will connect well, that captures our imaginations or hearts, is that of a hero. All of us know what it's like to have a hero. Everybody needs a hero. Everyone wants a hero. Everyone wants to imitate their hero, right? We have sports heroes. We have all kinds of stuff. Marvel Comics has given us a whole pantheon of heroes that we go after now with the Avenger movies and all that stuff and many more to come, I might add. And uh, The question behind that is what's the theme that they're working off of? What idea have they cornered? Why do those movies make millions and millions of dollars? I want to suggest that they go after the insatiable human need and desire for a hero that will rescue us. A hero who who hears our calls for help. A hero who will come to our rescue. A hero who has ability, right? You don't want some wimp for a hero. You want somebody who has ability. Uh, And maybe even add the tagline a little bit, a hero who's somewhat like us. Someone that we can relate to, whether we're an adult or a teenager or a kid. it's, It's somebody that we can actually relate to. And what most people miss when they look at the church is they miss the hero of the church. The people are no different. They, we, I, are just people who have been rescued by the hero. And every story is different. 
and every story is real. And there are as many stories here this morning as there are people attending. And so today I've been asked if I would share my story of how Jesus became my hero, and I'd love to do so, with a couple caveats. I'm now 62 years old and loving life, okay? I, I, yeah, I love it. I got a great life. The stories I'm going to be sharing happen in my late teens and early 20s. So obviously there are some huge discrepancies with who I am now and who I was then. As I get older, I find the gap widening, and I find myself more embarrassed and ashamed for the things that I did and the way I acted with every passing year. Any of you relate to that, right? Yes, thank you. We're not, I'm not alone. And so that's one thing. But I will try to step into character of what I was like back then. So for some of you, it might be uh, Pastor Steve that you don't know. Uh, I, when Pam and I got serious, I said to her, okay, so there's, there's two Steves. There's Pastor Steve, who you know, and then there was Steve before that. I said, which Steve do you want to know? And she says, well, I, I want to know both. I said, okay, we got to go back to Wisconsin. And so I took her home to my family. My brother Jim has a big farm kitchen, holds 15, 20, 25 people. And we're all sitting around. I said, hey, hey, everybody, Pam wanted to come home. She knows Pastor Steve, but she didn't know Steve before that. And she wants to know about that, Steve. Oh, come on. <laughs> I said, I'll be downstairs. Thanks a lot. And uh, so I went and hung out with my nieces and nephews. And she came down two hours later and she said, I would have never been in the same room with you, let alone dated you. I went, oh, man, there goes our relationship up in smoke. I said, well, what do you think? She says, well, it's obvious that God changes people. <laughs> right? She gave me a lot of grace. So that was really good. So that's the tone of it. Also, today I will share up to the point where Jesus became my hero. Uh, the stories of what happened after are even wilder and crazier than the stories I'll share with you today, but that will be for another time. When I share, in no way am I saying my story of how Jesus became my hero is a prototype or a model for somebody else. I surely hope it isn't. At best, it is an example of Jesus being a hero of even the worst. And if he could rescue me, then my story should give you hope and encouragement that he can rescue you as well. As you'll see from the story, I wasn't looking for a hero. I thought I was the hero. All right? My story will show you how badly mistaken I was. So can we just pray for a second? Let me give this to the Lord and then we'll start. Lord Jesus, thank you for a chance to do this. I pray that you will bring great glory to your name by sharing today. May your presence be among us. May your Holy Spirit be with us. Lord, may you open eyes to see and ears to hear. And I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Kayla says I have to put my hat on backwards so I look cool. All right. So here we go. Let's start. Uh, to set the stage, let me just give you some background, uh, especially if you're new, you wouldn't know this stuff. So I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up in a little town called Sugarbush, Wisconsin. Very famous town. All 30 of us got along just fabulously together. And uh, it is a, a fun little place. It's just 10 miles outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yep, that other football team, right? And uh, I grew up there, the Packers, that whole shebang. I grew up with Vince Lombardi era. You know, the guy who the Super Bowl trophy is named after? All right, that's where I grew up. I am the oldest of eight. My dad comes from a family of 15, four sets of twins. Imagine that, moms. My mom comes from a family of six. And so we literally had the cousins by the dozen thing going. All right. Uh, I had a fantastic childhood. I would wish my growing up on anybody. Uh, it was, I believe, the greatest time in the greatest country in the greatest period of history of the world. It was a fabulous deal. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic background. Uh, Green Bay, if you took a 25-mile square radius, 95% uh, Catholic. I joke the only cult we had were the Lutherans, right? <laughs> and so back there, everybody went to church, and uh, I was an altar boy till I was 18. And I knew all the right ideas about Jesus. Uh, I knew that he was God. I knew that he was born of the Virgin Mary. I knew he died on the cross for our sins. I knew that he rose again from the dead. I just didn't know he was real. Okay? I, it didn't connect. Just, phew, I missed it. And uh, somehow I, I just completely missed the reality of who he was. He, it was someone that people talked about. It wasn't, he wasn't a real person that you could actually meet. 
So let me uh, show where this all goes. So I was an all-American kid. All right, I grew up in, in the Midwest in high school. I did very well. I played football, wrestling, and track. Senior year, I was captain of all three of those teams. Uh, the, uh, I was a conference champ in wrestling. Uh, wrestling and track teams are conference championship teams. Uh, academically, I also did very well. I was the Fine Arts Club president my senior year, National Honor Society president, Spanish club president, and I went to state and drama twice. Now, I don't tell you that to tell you how cool I was, although you gotta admit, that was pretty good, right? <laughs> Yeah. I tell you that because I want to contrast that with, with something else that was going on, the backside or the hidden side of my life. Behind the all-American image up here, I was behind doing Steve stuff, right? And the Bible would call that sin. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, I had no idea what that meant back in junior high. I just knew that I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, and I tried to avoid people who would stop me from doing what I wanted to do. And so that started out, as with anything, usually it starts very small, right? And so my first memory of sin, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if you go back, what's your first memory of when you would say, I knew I sinned? My first memory was when I was a kid, and we were in the town of Luxembourg, that's the town where the high school was, and my Aunt Leona lived there, and she had 10 kids, and when my mom and dad go on vacations, they'd leave us with Aunt Leona, and so me and my cousin Claire went down to the Farmer's Traders. The Farmer's Traders was kind of a catch-all store that had something of everything there for the farmers in the area, and uh, we went in, and we stole some balloons. My cousin talked me into stealing some balloons. We stuffed them in our pocket, and when we were paying for some bubble gum going out, I pulled my hand out, and the balloons fell on the floor. And the lady who knew me and knew my family said, Steve, did you pay for those balloons? Mm-hmm. Right? And I stuffed them back in my pocket. And so my cousin and I walked out back to her house. And the lady behind the counter called my Aunt Leon up and said, by the way, your daughter and nephew stole some balloons from the store and they're coming your way. Busted. Right? I don't know if you have an Aunt Leona, but uh, she was the mom of the 15. You don't mess with Aunt Leona. And so I was in deep doo-doo. And I remember feeling so convicted that my aunt had to catch me uh, that I had swiped some balloons from the store. And so that's the first time I ever remember really, really sinning. Uh, but some other ways showed up. I was mean to my brothers and sisters. I was not the best older brother around and often... I would cheap shot them and they would cheap shot me and we kind of had a love thing going back and forth. And so I wasn't the best brother that way. The other thing that really jumped up is I realized I started lying. I realized I kind of had a gift and I could talk my way into things and talk my way out of things. And so I started to manipulate that to get away with things. And uh, part of that was in high school parties and girls and I didn't want my parents to know what was going on. So I manufactured stuff. Drinking came into it. Uh, big time in high school. The other thing that really kicked in was just this spirit of independence, and really the symptom of that was bad language. I thought I was tough because I could use bad language, right? And so that kind of came into my world and uh, how I started playing. Now, in high school, though, there's a lot of structure. In Wisconsin there, everybody knew everybody, every family's connected, so you just really couldn't get away with a lot. I had a lot of that structure kept my life in balance and in check. And besides that, I had a dad who tolerated no nonsense, and I was on a pretty short leash, right? So I really, uh, it, it didn't really blow up to anything. Where it really blew up is when I went to college. I went to college at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. We called it UW Zero. And uh, I went there because I, I wanted the partying of school in the state with the best guy-girl ratio in the state. That was my term. For, so guys, don't do that. All right, I'm looking at Sarah. Um, and so bad, bad reason for going. That's why I went. The famous saying about college is that you'll find whatever you're looking for, right? And I did. Uh, all the authority structure fell away, so you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do. And so I did. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 12, that there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. But it sure didn't feel or taste like death during my first year of college. Man, we ripped it up, right? We blew the world up. It was fun. Um, 
just, uh, just to give you a picture and a taste of where we were, so I was at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I uh, became an RA in Scott Hall. Scott Hall, 10 floors. I was the RA on, on the sixth floor. And the reason uh, I had applied for it, but they had turned me down, and the reason they turned me down is I was on the wrestling team at the school. The reason that they turned down is the wrestling team wasn't known exactly for their sanity. And so they didn't like the idea that all the wrestling team would be hanging on that floor, so they turned me down. Two of the guys that I want to describe to you uh, on that team will give you some idea of why. One guy's name was Rick Damaris. Rick Damaris, uh, 158 pounds, national champ at 158 pounds, lightning quick reflexes. He could hit a guy three times, you'd see one punch. And it was just unbelievable. And he was national champ. His friend or buddy was Rob Broadbent. The best way to describe Broadbent to you is he looked exactly like his name sounded. If you took the Hulk and squashed him down to 410, you'd have Broadbent, right? One of those kind of guys, right? And so these two guys were the ringleaders uh, on the wrestling team. And uh, they turned me down, but they had problems getting RAs for that floor because that floor was a really difficult floor. Uh, we had, at that time, there were uh, blacks on that floor, there were Hispanics on that floor, there were a couple Chinese guys on the floor who were boxers. Uh, there were a couple, I mean, it was just a mishmash of guys, and it was a boiling point. This is late 70s, this is racial turmoil in the inner cities, this is uh, Angela Davis and the Black Panthers. Any of you remember that? Right? Okay, you're old. And so, um, this is going back to that era, and so, when they made me the RA, I said, all right, here's the deal. Let me be the RA. Let me set it up the way I want. If it works, leave me alone. If it doesn't work, you can fire me and we'll all be cool, right? And they said, all right, we'll do it. So I went up. I called a big meeting. We're in the, the lobby uh, of the dorm room. And I pulled them all in. And you could tell already they're not liking me. And I said, all right, you guys don't like me at all, do you? And they go, no. And I said, well, I don't like you either, so we're even. And I said, but here's the deal. We've got a problem. And we can fix the problem if you will cooperate with me. And, and, they said, and I said, what's the problem? They go, we, the, we had a head RA that was trying to make a name for herself, and, and so they didn't like her meddling on the So, all right, here's the deal. New rules. You can do anything you want in your room. You can drink. You can smoke dope. You can rape your girlfriend. I really don't care. You can do it, all right, as long as it stays in your room. If it comes out into the hallway, then it's my problem. If it comes into the hallway, it's my problem. You won't just deal with me, but you'll deal with the wrestling team which is Damaris and Broadbent and Charlie Hibber. And Charlie Hibber was our heavyweight wrestler on the team, and he was in the room. I said, that right, Charlie? Yes, sir. And so they knew that if they took me on, they weren't just taking me on, they were taking the whole wrestling team on. That was kind of nice insurance. And so I got nervous the first night because I'm a country kid, right? I've never been in the inner city. I didn't, you know, the blackest thing we had were cows. I, you know, I was kind of out of context. And so I had a... a torn off t-shirt and I had a Pittsburgh Pirate baseball hat on my hat backwards like I'm wearing my hat right now and I had one of those little baseball bats you know they give away at Mariner games and stuff right I had that and then I had a fillet knife and I went out got drunk and I came back worried something's going to happen and sure enough about 10 30 some guy comes walking down the uh, down the hallway he's a black guy and he starts banging on the store and he's yelling and screaming and saying things about his mother and all that kind of stuff and uh, so I come out, and as he's banging on the door, I tap him on the shoulders with that baseball bat. Says, Excuse me, can I help you? Right? And he turns and he looks, and like, here's a guy, you know, like, you don't see that every day. And, uh, and you could see all of a sudden his eyes went black, and he was going to mess with me. And I went, oh, baby, here we go. And no sooner did that start, and who comes around the corner but Rick Damaris and Rob Broadbent. Ha-ha, <laughs> fight, Richie Babe, this is great, here we go. And they rip their jet, and they come, and the guy sees who they are, he knows who they are. Whoa! His eyes go white, he bolts down the stairwell and goes escaping out the dorm, all right? So that was kind of what that floor was like. Uh, we also were a little bit crazy. Uh, give you an idea, one time we decided this would be uh, Rick Damaris and, uh, and another friend, Ron Dork, were in his car, and then I and Broadbent were in his car. And it was always funny to watch Rob drive his car because he was so short, he could barely steal over the steering wheel. You know, that kind of thing, right? And um, so we're going, I think it was to the Battle of the Bands or something like that, but we're taking off through campus. It's a Saturday. We're going through, and uh, Rob's ahead. And our cars were, we call them ghetto cruisers. Those are great big old Buicks and Oldsmobiles. Remember those things, right? We call them ghetto cruisers, and they were our college cars. You could buy one for about 150 bucks. And so... We're going through the campus, 
And Rick and Rob are ahead of us, and we're coming up behind them. And one of those stoplights, one of those pedestrian stoplights turns red. And so Rob, Rick stops, and I look at Broadbent, and I go, dude, you're going to stop? And he goes, <laughs> no. And he just, bam, nails Rick's car and sends it flying through the intersection, right? You can hear Rick saying a few choice words about that from where his car is. So he, whoop, whoop, bam, knocks us over the curb. We start playing bumper cars. All right, we're smashed into each other. We went up and down the cafeteria steps with those cars. You know those nice little trees they plant? You know, just took them out, burned donuts on the lawn. Rick came, hit us on the rider side. And when he hit us, he busted the latch to the door. Now, we didn't know that. So we're laughing and we take off. And we go down between these two dorms. We come whipping around the corner. As we whip around the corner, the door flies open and I fly right out with the door. All right? Now, there's only two things holding me in the car. One, I've got my foot hooked on that little ledge, you know, down by the door. My left hand is plastered to the back of the seat, but the rest of me is flying out that way. Rob was so strong that he held on while the car's sliding around the corner, hangs on the wheel with one hand, shoots across the seat, catches me by the belt buckle, and just goes, bink, and I'm back in the car, all right? The second he did that, the car had slid too far sideways, and it slammed into one of those huge power poles. All we heard was, kaboosh! I should be a part of Puget Power right now, all right? Now, you asked me, were you scared? No, we didn't even think of it. We laughed. Man, we made a toothpick out of the thing, and we kept on going. Matter of fact, the end of the story is there's a bar just about two blocks from there. It was called Tasha's. We called it Sloshes because it had a concrete floor in the end of the night. They just washed it down. And uh, Rob dropped me off at the front. I said, where are you going? He said, never mind. So I come around. Here comes uh, Rick Damaris and, and uh, Ron Dorick. And they go, where's Broadman? I don't know. I said, he dropped me off and took off. Next thing we hear in the back of the parking lot is, rip, bam, rip, bam, rip, bam. And Rob is trash compacting Rob, Rick's car up against the cement retaining wall. All right? Yeah, a little, little off the rocker there. Uh, the next story, I, I, I'm cautious in telling this one, but I need to tell it because uh, it's tied to today. Robert, here's where you come in, man. So... I was a stoner, not just kind of a partial stoner. I was blow your mind, dope out forever stoner, all right? And uh, me and my buddy Mike Machowski and a bunch of guys hung together and uh, Mike, was his last name Machowski, so I called him my Polish brother and we were in high school together and best friends. And we would smoke dope and we'd, get, and we'd run out and we didn't have any money. We said, man, we're farmers. Why don't we grow our own dope? He said, that's a great idea. So when we'd go to parties, we'd just get the bags and we'd get all the seeds and we'd uh, take the seeds and we'd put them in Folger coffee cans, right? Remember those Folger coffee cans? And so we got to the place where we had two Folger coffee cans, those big ones like this, full of seeds. Now, it never occurred to us that you should keep the seeds separate. Like if you had Colombia seeds or Mexican seeds or Hawaiian seeds, or, we just threw them all in together, Right? And so we went out, and in Wisconsin, there's what are called heat swamps. And there's, in these heat swamps, uh, it's it just lots of water and really hot, so it's, it's pretty tropical. And so we went out there, and we dug holes, and of course, we came from farms, so we had a lot of liquid manure, so we put all the liquid manure in, covered them back up, watered them, and then we went away. And when we went away during the summer, both of us thought we would check up on it. And Mike ended up going up north, and I was working. And towards the end of the summer, we're at another party. We run out of dope again. I'm like, dude. And he goes, well, did you ever go check on the plants? I said, well, no. I thought you were checking on the plants. Well, I never checked on the plants. I was up north. Well, I said, I have, what do we, oh, we better go check it out. So we come back. The dope plants are gone. Now, understand this. The, the idea that it's legal today blows my mind. Okay, because I know what we were like back there. And the dope now is 150 times more. Po I'm like, whoa, we are way out of league here. But um, this was when you got 15-year felony for raising. So we, if we'd have got busted, we'd have been facing 15-year felony charges in prison. And we look, and the plants are gone. And we're like, somebody is on to us. Somebody stole our plants. And then we said, oh, man, where'd these big bushes come from? And we looked, and like... 12 to 13 feet high and 15 feet across. I'm like, whoa, dude, we got dope. Like, 
Like, not a little bit. We got like, oh, no, because we're standing there. And you, they were so big, you could see them from the highway that was a half mile away. Like, oh, we're going to get busted, you know. So we run to the farm. Mike Machowski's farm, his dad's farm was just a mile away. Run to the farm, get a chainsaw. Because the stems were this thick. It looked like bamboo shoots. And so, right, start a fire, burn all. We're getting high off the fire. We stuffed it into my dad's 1967 pickup truck with the top on, filled the entire back with buds and leaves and stuff like that, right? We take off. We're going through Green Bay. Cop pulls next to us. We just wave. They thought it was hay, right? So we... We're doing this, well, this dope, because we cross-pollinated all, it was really good dope. And so we started selling it. thought, man, we can make money off of this, you know, entrepreneurial farm boys. And so we started letting people know that we had some dope and they could try it. And it, it was great stuff, better than anything on the street. And so all of a sudden, we had all kinds of people coming, right? And then one day, our friend Mike Allard, he runs a gas station in Green Bay. He's a mechanic and... This black limo pulls up, right? And here's this black limo, and Louis and Vito get out, right? I mean, mob guys, like black suits packing the whole thing. Hey, we hear there's some good stuff on the street. We'd like to get in on it. And like, whoa, my buddy goes, dude, I smoke dope, but I don't know anything about stuff on the street. And I said, well, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And he says, here's our card. Give us a call if you find out. And they get back in the car, and... Mike calls up and says, dude, the mafia's after you. I said, what? We don't have mafia in Green Bay. What are you talking about? The mafia, there's no mafia in Green Bay. And he goes, dude, I'm telling you, black car, Louis Vito guns, they, uh, ah! So we're like, we're going to die, right? We're like, oh my gosh. So now we don't know what to do. So we give all our dope away, okay? To tell you how much dope we had rolled in bags, in our basement, we had an eight by four sheet of plywood. We rolled the bags up. It filled the entire wall, and then we put the sheet of plywood over it. Oh, God. Right? We gave that all away to all these different people. Said, "Don't tell them where you got it from." Don't tell. And we hid for six months, laid low. Now, here's the reason I tell you that story. Thirty-five years later, I'm at Alder Lake, right? Alder Lake, where we do our, our high school and junior high camp, and out there. And uh, Robert McDonald, McDonald back there. Robert, wave your hand, my buddy. All right, we're in the kitchen talking. And I said, hey, Robert, tell me your story. And he says, ah, Steve, you wouldn't be able to relate to my story. I said, oh, I, I'm pretty sure I could. He goes, no, nah, I don't think you could. He says, well, I said, well, let me try. He said, okay, give me a story. So I tell him this story about growing this dope. And we're, it's just me and him in the kitchen. Youth, right, you know where you are, right? In the kitchen, all the late. And we're sitting there. And I start telling this story, and we get to the end of it. He's on the floor laughing. I go, what are you laughing about? He goes, dude, that was my family. I was in the mob in Chicago. I remember that story. So here the mobster and the dope grower were sitting 35 years later, both redeemed by Jesus, in the kitchen at a Christian youth camp. We are roaring with laughter. We are crying. Everybody else is looking. My wife's going, what is wrong with them? <laughs> We're like, you, dude, you tried to kill me. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> it was, yeah, okay, so that was the deal, all right? All right, I'll tell you all that stuff. But then the second year, everything flipped. My world blew up. Everything, everything started to go sideways. Uh, it actually had been happening for a long time. But it culminated in this second year. Um, as I look back, if I had to pinpoint where the blow up in my spiritual life really happened, it actually began uh, way back when I was a kid with pornography. The old style kind, right? As if that's any better. Magazines under my dad's beds, dirty novels in the garage, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I got sexually involved in high school, and I would tell you, it, sin killed my sense of God. I remember waking up early one morning, we milk cows, and you get up about four, and I remember the sun rising, and I remember going, wow, there's something about life. There's something special for my life. When I got involved in sin, sexual sin, it killed all of that. Just, it just wiped it out. That's why the Bible warns us about it so hard. Now, on the outside, you would have not known that anything had happened. Um, 
I kept up all the outward religious performance to please others I, I, and also to keep my parents off my trail. But I had lost any real sense of relationship or reality with God. Besides this, I knew I was a sinner. You didn't have to tell me. There was no, plus there was no real way to fix it, nor did I really want to fix it. I liked what I was doing, okay? I didn't want to fix it. I just wanted it to work so it wouldn't wreck me. And so uh, I knew I was going to hell, and I kind of decided, you know, if I'm going to hell, I might as well deserve to go there, right? I don't want to just kind of get in. If I'm going to go, let's go in first class. God seemed really remote. Uh, uh, he was way out there doing his God things, and I was down here doing my Steve things, and I kind of hoped they would never meet, never come together. Uh, I really didn't think God was real, although I professed he was. Actually, I hoped he wasn't, because if there was a really living God, I was dead meat, and I knew it. And so I was also kind of afraid. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that played out in spades in my life. I flunked out of college. All my relationships went sideways. I was broke. I don't have time to tell you the stories today, but uh, if we had more time, from the time I was 16 to 22, which youth group gang, you're out there, my buddies and posse, I'm seeing y'all, that's roughly the same six-year period you're going through right now, right? From the time I was 16 to 22, 15 friends were killed or maimed directly as a result of alcohol, drugs, or trying to drive something while they were doing it. I remember coming back from one party at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and looking up at my dorm, the 10-story dorm, and there was a guy hanging. He had hung himself and he was hanging out the window. He was at one of the RAs on the floor that I knew well. And so all kinds of stuff started to just blow up and go sideways. Um, worse, I, I had absolutely no sense of purpose or vision of what to do with my life. I mean, here I was a straight-A student, and I was an absolute doorknob. I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. I had no idea what to aim at. I had no idea. Um, I, I joke today that if God hadn't found me, I'd still be wondering what I'd do when I grew up, all right? And so uh, I just didn't know what to aim at. And then something really strange began to happen. As wild as those stories are, the stuff that's about to happen is even wilder. At first, it was so subtle I hardly noticed it, but eventually I realized there was something to this God thing. There was this unmistakable pull that seemed to be drawing me his way. Uh, the first place where this became aware is on the dorm floors, on the 10th floor, was a guy named Jeff Cole. And Jeff Cole it was uh, uh, a kung fu guy. He was a kind of a Bruce Lee sort of guy. He grew up in Hong Kong and what, 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 you know, kind of dude. And uh, he'd do push-ups with his fingertips and lift jars and do all this crazy stuff. And he was also a believer. And so he talked to me and he talked to me about Christ. And he actually gave me a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict that's on my bookshelf yet today with a letter in there, hoping that I would become a Christian somewhere along, down along the line. And so Jeff started to have an impact on me. And then I went and sold books for a summer. Any of you ever have the Southwestern Company come to your house and they're selling different books and that kind of stuff? I did that. I ended up in North Carolina. That's in the South. I'm a Yankee. I'm from the North. And so I'd wind up on their doorstep and they would say, uh, boy, are you saved? I go, what? I mean, the only thing we say back then were S&H green stamps. I had no idea what they were talking about. Right? And they said, well, are you saved? I go, ah, what? They said, well, do you believe there's a God? Well, I said, of course they believe in God. Well, do you believe Jesus is God? Yeah. I said, everybody knows that. Well, do you believe he was born of the Virgin Mary? Dude, I'm Catholic. I believe that more than you. Well, do you believe that he died for your sins on the cross? Well, absolutely. I said, well, do you believe he rose from the dead? Sure. Are you saved? I don't know. I figured it was just a north-south church lingo dialogue divide. And, and I grew up, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up with, if you want to be religious, fine, but just don't become a crazy. And a crazy was a person who just went too far, just took it over the edge, just went, you know, kind of wacko. And so I was terrified of becoming, uh, quote, unquote, crazy. And so, but there was one guy down there who really had me pegged. He invited me to his house, gave me some iced tea, and we were talking. And he found out my, my background and what I was doing and stuff. And he said, well, he says, Steve, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? I said, well, sure he did. He says, well, stop for a minute. If he rose from the dead, that means he's here right now. And I stopped and I went, wow, I'd never thought of it that way before. 
So he's actually alive. If he's not, if he didn't rise from the dead, then he's not here. He says, so that means one of two things. He says, Steve, if he's not risen from the dead, I mean, if he rose from the dead, then you should quit doing the things you're doing and start doing the things I'm doing. And I'm thinking, how does he know the things I'm doing? Like, was he reading my mind or what's going on here? And he says, but on the other hand, if Jesus did raise from the dead, I should quit doing the things I'm doing and start doing the things you're doing because it doesn't make any difference anyways. And I remember that for the first time, it had a practical impact that said, you know what? There ought to be some real tangible relationship to this deal. Uh, it can't just be words. And then, uh, down, I don't know if you've been down south, but it's hot. Like, real hot, like sticky hot. Like, take a shower and two minutes later, you didn't know you took a shower hot, right? And so I would go in, in this town out in a grove of trees, magnolia trees, was this little church. And it, was a, a, it wasn't more than the width from speaker to speaker, the back of the church. And I would sit in there because the breeze would come through and it was really cool. And on the back of the wall of the church, like there, were all these tracks. Uh, I don't know. Do you know what tracks are? You know, little cartoon stories kind of thing. And so you'd pull it open and it had scripture in there. And so I read stuff from Romans and stuff from Revelation. I'm like, wow, weird. I've never read this stuff before. And at the back, it would always say, would you like to pray and accept Jesus Christ as Savior? No. <laughs> read another one, right? Well, through the course of summer, I read all those tracts along. There are probably a couple hundred of them. And so I got a, all kinds of uh, scriptural information and knowledge that I didn't have before, which wasn't helpful because it just made me feel more guilty. While I was down south then, a guy showed up who had sold for the Southwestern Company, and uh, he had been in uh, Oklahoma, and they run in some legal problems. So he was coming through town. He saw me carrying the blue case. He stops and says, hey, you sell for Southwestern? Yeah, well, I did too. Get out, and we start talking. And, he, and I told him where I was from, and he says, oh, well, you know, the, if you're from Green Bay, you know the Packer coaches, right? And I said, yeah, I know them all. And he says, well, do you know Coach Bob Lord? And I go, no, nah, that name doesn't sound familiar. It turns out that the Packers had hired him that summer uh, from the New York Giants, Ray Perkins staff, over to um, the, the staff for the Packers. And he says, I, I go to school at Duke University with his daughter, Martha. I says, oh, he says, well, if, if I wrote you a letter, would you take the letter home and give it the letter to her? Because I don't know their address in Green Bay. I said, well, sure. I said, is she good looking? He said, oh, she's a babe. Really? I'm thinking, wow, a babe, a Packer coach daughter. I'm thinking autographed footballs, tickets on the 50-yard line. I'm like, this is a great idea. And so he writes the letter, right? Next day he comes back, he gives it to me. I stuff that letter in my pocket. And uh, I was in that little church again and I read one of those tracks again and it said, do you want to? And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe that's the piece I'm missing. So maybe I should just pray this prayer. So I prayed the prayer, stuffed the track back in and ran out of the church. Afraid that the sky was going to roll back. Angels are going to peek out and go, hoo hoo, gotcha, buddy. Busted, right? Nothing happened. I went, oh, well, all right. So I go to Green Bay. I call up. The first thing I do is I get home. I call up the Packer coach's house. I call up. The mom answers the phone. Guys, right? No. Hi, how are you? Are you a friend of mine? No, well, I just, you know, yeah, is she home? No, she's not. Oh, well, when will she back? Well, no, she, she's gone. Well, I know she's gone, but when will she come back? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm not explaining this right. She's, she's left. I go, well, yeah, but when will she come back? She said, no. She left for school. So two minutes before I had called the house up, she had gotten in her car and had gone back and driven back to North Carolina. And I went, rats, there go my pecker tickets, right? And so I talked to the mom for some more, hung up. But I kept that letter in my wallet. And I go to school. And when I go to school, so back to the sixth floor. Remember I told you about that floor? On the floor next to me lived two Christian guys, Mike and Mike. There was Big Mike and Little Mike. Right? Little Mike was an artist and a really cool guy. And Big Mike was the three-time state champion at 189 pounds in Wisconsin. He was a hoss. Right? Very impressed with him. And they were believers. And so I would bring a girl in my room to do a Don Juan number, and they would pray. You know how college walls are thin? Right? Oh, Lord Jesus, bless Stephen, that beautiful young lady with him. And Lord, we'd pray. Right? And they'd go on and on. And, like, and the gal would remember some test. 
that she'd have to do and she'd leave, right? So I would go out, I'd go to that bar Tasha's, I'd come back at four in the morning, I'd kick on their door, boom, 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 rise and shine, boys, it's time to praise Jesus, hallelujah, right? And so we had this little thing going between us. Um, so I'm going through the campus one day and I look and here's this big poster and it says, Coach Bob Lord of the Green Bay Packers coming to speak. And I went, oh, I still got that letter in my wallet. I could still get my Packer tickets, right? So I look and I'm, I'm tracking down and it says sponsored by the Navigators. Okay, now I had no idea. Do you know who the Navigators are? Big time Jesus memorized scripture uh, over the top Jesus ministry kind of people. Dave and Tracy Reber here are in the Navigators, all right? I thought it was a sailing club at school. <laughs> so I looked and I went, oh, Mike and Mike are in that sailing club. So I run back down the hall and I knock on their door and Big Mike comes to the door and I say, hey, Mike, I want to come to your sailing meeting this week. <laughs> what? You know, the, the one with the Packer coach. Oh, awesome, Mitch. That's fabulous. Never told me what it was. He says, as a matter of fact, we'll buy your ticket for you. I said, oh, you, you, oh, you, yeah, okay, you have to have a ticket. Oh, I didn't even know. Thanks, man. So I'm, I'm pumped. I'm going to meet this Packer coach, and I don't know. Uh, growing up in Green Bay, I mean, Vince Lombardi was far more God than God ever dreamed of being. I mean, the Packers, that was just everything. So I thought, wow, I'm going to actually meet a Packer coach. And so I go in. Have you ever gone to something where, where you thought you were going to and what you actually went to are two different things? I run in, I'm right on the front row, right where Misty is. I want to meet this coach. I want to be the first one to the stage. And they bring some girls out, like, like this, right? And, and they're singing beautiful music, but words like Jesus and love and blah. And, um. I thought, okay. Yeah, but, you know, if the Packer coach comes out and talks about the Packers, it'll be great, right? And the other thing I noticed, I looked around me, kind of out of the corner of my mind, everybody was dressed up. Nice clothes. I went, oh, man, here I am in cut-off T-shirt and Oshkosh by gosh, bib overalls, right? That's where they're made. And so that was our college uniform. And so I thought, man, as a Packer coach, I should have dressed up. Rats. But I thought, well, okay, as long as he talks about Packers, it'll be cool. So he comes out at Emerson and says, hey, we're going to take a break, and then I'm going to come back. My name's Bob, Coach Bob Lord of the Green Bay Packers, and I'm going to share with you tonight how Jesus has radically changed my life. Now, I didn't do that outwardly, but I did that inwardly. Man, I went, whoa, freak farm. How did I get in here? And I'm going to bolt. Well, who's taking tickets at the door now but Mike and Mike? I can't leave, right? Plus, worse, everybody knows who I am. They look who's here. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Oh, great, right? <laughs> this is going bad. Get done. I go up to the Packer coach, introduce myself, give him the letter, tell him the story. You can tell he's kind of confused, but he says, yeah, I'll get this to my daughter. And, uh, and he takes off. I'll come back to him. I'll come back to him in just a minute. But what started at college then was I started to have a split personality because there was something about the Christians that I really liked. They had something that I did not have, and I knew it. I didn't know what it was, but it was different. It just the way they talked, the way their attitude. They were always smiling, right? And so I, I knew there was something different. And so it was easy at college to do this because uh, you never would find the Christians out, or I mean the partiers out. I got this all backwards. You'd never find the partiers up in the morning studying. It was always the Christians in the cafeteria. And you'd never find the Christians out in the bar, right? So the two worlds never came together. And so I would hang out with the Christians in the morning. Then I'd go out to parties and I kind of lived a split dichotomy. But I was warming up to the Christians. And then I was playing soccer and I broke my ankle. A guy kicked me and I flew right into the goalpost and snapped my ankle. And so I was back in Green Bay. I couldn't go to school that fall. And... Uh, and then this is where it really began to turn. So I, I worked at a, a, a factory in, Green, in Denmark, Wisconsin, called Lake to Lake. And there was a guy there named Stanley Kans. My dad would pick up milk at the farms and haul it to the factory. And Stanley Kans works. And I got to describe, Stanley was like 6'6", six, 6'8", six, six, 285, 300 pounds. Big man. He was a butter churner. You ever seen those guys? They had forearms like Papa. Just take your hand and go like that, okay? Massively powerful. And Stanley would talk to me, and one day we were in the, co in the cafeteria. He says, Steve, tell me about college. So I told him about college, and he says, oh, that's incredible, Steve. And he says, anything else? I said, yeah, you know, there's this, there's this group of people um, that I met that are kind of weird but kind of cool. He says, well, what, 
what kind of, what's their name? Or what? I said, well, I don't really know for sure. I, I think they're called born agains or Christians or something like that. And he goes, oh, Steve, that's awesome. I'm a Christian. Oh, great. <laughs> right? And I said, well, Stanley, that, that's fantastic, but uh, I, I have no intention of becoming a Christian. And he says, I know, but when you do, here's what you're going to need to know. No, Stanley, you don't understand. I just got done telling you, I'm not going to become a Christian. I know, but when you do, here's what you're going to need to know. Stanley, you don't get it. I am not becoming Christian. I know, but when you do, here's what you're going to need. He was relentless, right? And he just kept on me and kept sharing and, and talking like that. And uh, at work, I normally prided myself on being pretty together, but one time I was supposed to go to a bluegrass festival and uh, a foreman changed my schedule on purpose just so I couldn't go and he and I had had a row going and I just blew my gasket. I mean, I was veins popping, spit flying. I was, and everybody in the plant just ran. And they ran by Stanley. And they go, what happened? Is Mitch has blown a cork. He's going to kill Felsheim. And I was literally going to take a fork, fork truck that I drove and run him over. And Stanley goes, oh my. And so he comes into the warehouse where I'm at. I'm sitting on this fork truck. I'm so mad I can't even speak. And he comes walking right towards me. And he's got this huge hand. He puts his hand on my shoulder and goes, you know, Steve, this would be a great time to let Jesus shine through your life, and I know you'll do a good job. I'll pray for you. And then he turned on and walked away. And I went, they need to lock him up. There's something wrong with him. People do not respond that way. That's, I, don't, I may be crazy, but he's, he, whoa, he's some, something's wrong with him, right? Just blew my gasket. And from that point on, I, I describe it as, I walked through these revolving set of doors and popped out on the Christian side and said, whoa, weird, people really do this? And then I kept trying to get through the revolving doors and I couldn't get through the door. I kept getting spat back out on the Christian side. I would run into believers and you always knew they were a believer because they were smiling. I'd go, oh, you're a Christian, right? Yeah, would you like to know? No, get away from me, right? It was kind of creepy. And, um, and I was fighting God. I was terrified. There's an old uh, English term for God called the hound of heaven. Have you ever heard that term? And the idea is from the old fox hunting days when the hound would not get thrown off the trail no matter how the fox disguised the trail. And boy, God was on my trail. He was tracking me and I was scared spitless. I had no idea what to do. In the midst of this, Stanley goes to church in Bethel Bapt at Bethel Baptist in Green Bay. That's the church that Pastor Jan Hedinga was the pastor at back in the day there. Some of you know that name. Guess who else also went to that church? Coach Bob Lord of the Green Bay Packers. Stanley, hearing my story, goes up to Bob and he says, Bob, there's a young guy at work who wants to become a Christian. He lied. <laughs> there's a young guy who wants to go to church. He wants to become a Christian. And I just know if you invited him to our Bible study, he would come. So we were in our basement. Our basement was, uh, you know, down poles and big speakers, music, foosball table in the middle. And we had black lights and when people got loaded, we turned the black lights on and we painted the poles flat black so you couldn't tell where they were. And then people would walk into them, bong, yeah, I got another one, All right? That was, and that was our basement. And so the phone rings, a party's going on. I pick up the phone. I go, yo, Animal Farm, how can I help you? And I hear this deep, re resonant bass voice. Hello, uh, this is Coach Bob Lord of the Green Bay Packers. Can I speak to Steve, please? Ah! Like, Packer coaches don't talk to nobodies, right? I mean, you may go to a Seahawks practice, but you don't get to go down on the field and hang with Pete, right? And the same thing in Green Bay. And I'm like, what's he doing chasing me around? I left him in Oshkosh. What's he doing back here? And, and then all the guys in the party are going, whoa, Mitch, you know, oh, yeah, hey, you know, I'm back on the phone. He says, uh, Steve, I'm friends with Stanley Kantz, and he said that you had an interest in coming to our Bible study. And would you like to come? And have you ever where your head says one thing and your mouth says another? In my head, I said, hell no. And I heard myself saying, oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Hung up the phone. What did I just do? Bible, what? Are you, you know, like, you've got to be kidding me. So now I'm really freaked out. And uh, so this is no longer neutral. You know, hey, Steve, you should think about God. No, this really came down. What it really came down to, because control and trust, right? I, I, I wanted control and I didn't trust God. I love the idea. Make no mistake, I love the idea that God loved me. I just didn't like the idea he had the right to tell me what to do. 
All right? And so he and I were battling and out. This became battle royale together between me and him. And a showdown was coming. I literally knew God didn't like sin, so I smoked and drank for three months straight. I do not remember from December of 1977 to January of 1978. I don't remember that time period at all. all right? God was chasing me, and I was running for all I was worth. And I'm going to work. Uh, I worked the night shift at Lake to Lake. We made powdered milk. You ever use powdered milk? It's gross. Okay? <laughs> Trust me. Uh, and, and I'm going to work at the factory. It's about 11 at night. And I'm yelling at God on the way to work. I, you're messing up my parties and you're messing up my life. And I hang, 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 hang. And then furthermore, just get this straight. I am not becoming a Christian. Got it? And I literally heard the words, oh yeah, watch this. And I pulled the truck over. This is my dad's 67 Chevy again. Pulled the truck over the and went, all right, Mitch, you've lost it. You're hearing voices, dude. <laughs> this is what they talk about on the movies. You are going to end up in a psych ward. And I'm like really freaked out. Plus that night, it didn't help. There was this huge electrical storm and lightning flash. I'm like, wah, look like a horror movie, right? And so I get to work. And uh, how, this, how this worked in the factory is up on the first floor, you had this huge dryer about the size of this right here. And in that, you'd spray condensed milk like nozzles, right? And just, psh, and it would come down like snowflakes. <laughs> then a scraper would take it, <laughs> scrape it down, run it down a chute. And I was down on the second floor. It would come down the chute. It would come into a big shaker machine, just, shoo, 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 shoo. it had lumps in it. That's why I told you it was gross. Shoo, 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 right? Take all the lumps out. Then it would come down between a cloth sock and that shaker was a big bin. Then there was an auger. And I better get over here because I'm going to whack the speakers out. So here's this auger. You take a 100-pound dog food bag, whoop, right? And it would fill the bag. Then you take the bag, you put it here, and you'd weigh it. And then next to it, you had the sewing machine. And the sewing machine would take tape, take it over, and then stitch through it, right? Just like dog food bags or barbecue brick, brisket bags. And then it would come out and go on a, on a, what do you call them things? I just like, but a conveyor belt. There we go. Thank you. And uh, it could hold like seven or eight of these bags and you'd empty them on a pallet and then you come back, do the whole thing again. So I'm there. I still got the words ringing in my ears. Oh yeah, watch this. The guy upstairs was named Tuffy. He had run that machine for 35 years. So he just put it on an automatic pilot. He'd go sit in the coffee room, right? So I'm downstairs and I'm doing this bag and thing. And I hit the foot pedal. Back up a little bit here. I hit the foot pedal so that, that I could... Uh, Moved the bag, and it just blew apart. I mean, springs and screws and everything, just all like, whoa, no, right? And I realize now I have no conveyor belt because I go over to try and flip the switch, and it shorted the thing out. So now I have to do that by hand, right? So I'm stacking bags, so I run back, bag on, jump, right? And I run to get the bag, and I pick the bag up, and I listen behind me, I hear this whomp, whomp, whomp. And the tape had wadded up the size of a softball in that sewing machine. And it was trying to sew through that and pow! And it just broke the sewing needle off the machine, right? Broke the arm off of it. Bang, and it fell on the floor and like, oh no! Right, so now I got a broken sewing machine and a broken conveyor belt. And I'm thinking, man, shut the thing down. But there's nobody upstairs listening to the phone, right? So I think, okay. So I keep doing bags and I got bags put around me. I put a bag on, pull the bag off. Powder mill keeps dumping out. The auger doesn't shut off. It keeps dumping on the floor. Boom, like this. It starts looking like white Christmas in there, right? And so I do a couple bags. I shut it down. I'm banging on this. Uh, when I pulled the bag off, by the way, on the sewing machine, the bag tore in half. And so hot powder milk on a concrete floor is like you know, sawdust on a dance floor. I was banging my shins into everything, and I was mad. And, and so I shut the auger down. Well, the bin was fuller than I thought, and all of a sudden the sock between the bin and the shaker filled up. And when it did that, the shaker tried to shake, and it just shredded that sock. And now powdered milk by the ton starts flying through that room. Boom, boom, boom. It looks like White Christmas. I'm Frosty the Snowman, right? Boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, it just broke me. I was like, oh, no. And I knew it was God because I had heard those words. Oh, yeah, watch this. And I just was beside myself, and I said, that's it. I can't take it anymore. 
If you want what's left of my life, you can have it. I can't do this anymore. And by the way, you better not ever dump me either. That's, how I, that's not the way you actually come to Christ, right? But that's how I actually came to Christ was at 3 in the morning in a powdered milk factory in Denmark, Wisconsin. All right? Give the Lord a hand on that. Is that pretty awesome or what? You know, if you think about it, that's what Northview is really about. We're really about introducing people to Jesus, helping them grow in the relationship to become like him. And if God's been having a conversation with you, it's entirely possible he has, and he's been tugging on your heart the same way he's tugging on mine, you can cross that gap today. You don't have to wait. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as my story. All right? As a matter of fact, I hope it isn't. But you may, in my telling story, you may have recognized or related to some of the basic points of the gospel. Let me run through them quickly for you. My sin was quite obvious, but the Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And what I realized, sin is no respecter of persons. It, it tags all of us. And because of that, we have no way to unload the burden of sin or, or have the ability to cross over that gap that we feel that those sins have created between me and God, right? It just it feels like there's a wall there. The Bible says we need to take this rescue offer from Jesus seriously because the alternative is permanently, eternally being separated from God in the place the Bible calls hell. The Bible describes it as a fiery furnace or a lake of fire. Someone said to me a while back, well, that's just metaphor. And I go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. They go, why? If that's the metaphor for the reality, that's awful. What's the reality like if it's that's only metaphor? I said, that's terrible description. And eternal life is... Not doing better, I grew up with that idea, uh, or being more religious or trying harder. It's really about placing our faith whoops, in Jesus Christ to forgive us our sins and rescue us by faith from my sins and then restore me into a relationship with God. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It, I, I had a hard time finding the way, and a hard time coming reconciling the truth. But I did find the life. You know, I found what I'd been looking for was really love, and I found it in a way I'd never expected through the Lord Jesus. So to receive eternal life, all you have to do is pray in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. It could sound something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I've resisted you, and I know also that I've sinned. Maybe not the same way Steve did, but still, I know I've sinned against you, and I've been separated from you. I want to surrender and ask you by faith to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life right now. Right now, this minute. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin and restoring me into a relationship with you. I promise to follow you all the days of my life. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So John and Mal and gang, come on up right now, and they're going to lead us in some worship after. But if that is you this today, if that's you today, then I want to give you the chance to pray that prayer. So we just, would you uh, just close your eyes and allow me to do this and ignore the person next to you? Have you heard the Lord knocking on your door? I heard the Lord knocking on mine. I told you the crazy story of it. I told you what he rescued me from. Obviously, he's changed my life to a great degree. Have you let him in? Maybe God brought you here today just for you to hear this message. You may have heard it a hundred times before and it never clicked, but it's clicking today. Or maybe this is the first time you ever heard it. And maybe you've just drifted for a long time and it doesn't resonate anymore and you know you've got to re-up. And you've got to stop doing your own thing and you've got to come back to him on his terms. Any of those are possibilities. I want to give you a chance to respond to the Lord today. Would you just close your eyes and let me pray for you? Lord, if someone's here and the message has connected, then I would ask that, Lord, you would let them know right now that you have forgiven them, that you have come into their life. May they right now find yourselves asking, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know I need you. I cannot fix this. I haven't been able to turn it. I can't get through the gap. I can't jump it. And I know it's got to be closed. Lord Jesus, please rescue me. Become my hero. Save me from the stuff that has entangled me. 
And Lord, if anybody's praying that way right now with you and they're expressing in, in the best words they know how, my words to you were terrible. I'm embarrassed to admit how I approached you. And yet you heard my heart. Hear their heart today. And I ask, Lord, that you will bring your peace will flood into their life, that they will know they've met you, and they will know you've done a work for them. And we ask for this in your son's name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand, all right? John and Mallory are going to lead us in worship. Would you stand? Let's respond.
break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I'm a religious professional, all right? I actually ran into the resurrected Christ in that powdered milk factory, three feet of powdered milk. I was not only white on the outside, I was white on the inside. He cleansed me. It was awesome, all right? Let's hope you have that same kind of story. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to ask Rob to come out, give us some instructions, and then we get to hang together. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We're going to have a meal together. We're going to be able to spend time. I share that story. I give that to you in faith. Use it however you want today. And Lord, we bless you for what you've done in our lives. It isn't always as dramatic as my story, but it's always eternal, and it always matters. And so we pray for others that they will come to know you the same way we did, and we ask for that favor in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, Rob. I didn't realize how ridiculous an apron was till I'm in front of you. So I'm wearing an apron. It's awesome. So we've got a team back here grilling up a bunch of hot dogs for us. We have chips, we have salads, we have cookies, there's drinks over here. So in just a moment, if you're hungry and ready for lunch, you can head around the edge of the shelter. There's a staircase, the line is double-sided. Hot dogs are already in the buns to help things go faster. If you do not want a bun, let our cooks know and they'll hook you up. There will be a snow cone machine or a truck here at some point. And when they show up and are parked and ready to go, Free snow cones on us for everybody. It's going to be awesome. We have field games over here, splash pads open. We have reserved all of the shelters and picnic tables, so make yourself at home. We will get your attention when it's time for kickball. That's enough stuff. Hot dogs are ready. Have an awesome afternoon. <laughs>